Good evening, everybody. Dave, Randy, thank you. Uh, Dave and Randy uh, covered what I would call kind of the soft stuff uh, a little bit. And uh, the soft stuff um, is as important, or quite frankly, more important uh, than what I'm going to cover, which I guess we would call the hard stuff, all right? And hard doesn't mean it's any more complicated or difficult. Good. Uh, it, it just means it's more substantive, and I think uh, a lot of the substantive stuff um, is where people's heads start to spin. So my job here tonight is to uh, take some fairly involved, not complicated, not difficult topics and make them understandable and simple. What I'd like to do is just start out and introduce myself. Uh, my name is David Dvorak. Uh, I was born and raised in Omaha, so I'm what you would call a city slicker, I guess. Uh, speaking of city slickers, that reminds me of a bit of a joke. I've got to loosen this crowd up a little bit here because we're going to talk, talk taxes and, and those sorts of things in a minute, so you may want to run to the bar when we get into that. But um, have you heard the joke about the lawyer and the farmer? Somebody probably has in this group. All these jokes, I think, circulate from time to time. Here's the setup. Picture this. Fancy lawyer in big city uh, fancies himself as a, a hunter. Uh, but the way he hunts is not quite the same way that you or I may hunt. He hunts from his car, fancy sports car. So one day the farmer dresses up in, in his uh, top of the line hunting gear, jumps in his sports car, and he drives out to the country. And he uh, spies a, a flock of pheasants late winter, early winter. And uh, he didn't get out of his car. He just kind of sets the gun on the, on the window ledge there and pop, shoots it off, and he hits one. Bird drops about 20 yards from the car, drops in the ditch, but on the other side of the fence from the road. So he goes, doggone it, I gotta get out. Gets out of the car, goes down into the ditch, reaches down over the fence to grab the pheasant. Somebody grabs his arm. There's a farmer standing there on the other side of the fence. The farmer says, uh, that's my pheasant. It's on my side of the property line. The lawyer says, well, wait a minute, sir. He goes, I'm a lawyer, I know the law, I shot this from a county road, I don't care where it fell, it fell in private and public land, it's my pheasant. The farmer said, that isn't how we work around here. It's on my property, it's my pheasant. The lawyer says, I can, I can quote you the statute. It says that I have the right to that bird. The farmer says, I'll tell you what, we have a way of settling things around here. What we do is, each guy takes a shot at the other one, take turns. The guy that's standing gets the pheasant. Lawyer thinks about it and he says, uh, okay. Farmer goes, I go first. The farmer, <laughs> farmer wheels back, he pops the lawyer on the chin, buckles his legs a little bit. Farmer doesn't fall, or the lawyer doesn't fall. Looks over at the farmer and he says, now it's my turn. Farmer looks at him and he goes, nah, keep the bird. I suppose the moral to that story is, is that sometimes we as lawyers and planners um, get caught in the detail of things. And you know, kind of the broader picture I think here is that you do have to take a broader view of things. And you have to look at this sort of planning as not just one element, but it's a bunch of elements that together make up a plan. And uh, yes, taxes are a part of it. We have a saying in our office, in our practice group, however, that we don't let the tax tail wag the proverbial dog. It's an element. And I'm going to get to something here in a second that I'm going to make a wager with everybody here in the crowd. I may be uh, the most liked guy in the room if the bet that I take on this uh, uh, pans out eventually. But we'll get to that in a second on the tax, on the tax subject. A little bit about me. I, I, was a, I am a city slicker. I was born and raised in Omaha. Uh, my parents, though, both grew up on farms, and thus kind of my passion for this sort of planning. My dad grew up on a farm uh, near Howells, Nebraska. Uh, my mom grew up on a farm uh, in west central Iowa, a small town called Persia, Iowa, uh, and that farm is still in, in our family. And I will give you some shared experience on some of this planning that I've dealt with my family um, uh, by and through uh, my mother and, and um, kind of not the outcome that you would expect probably from an estate business succession planning attorney, but as I get older, I've been doing this for about 17 years now, uh, uh, every learned experience um, benefits somebody else. And I went through this process with my family and, and the outcome, uh, as nifty as I thought it was gonna be, 
uh, in the end, um, hasn't turned out quite like I expected. So point there is, is that we can plan and we should plan, all right? But everybody has to understand that human beings are human beings and the best laid plan, sometimes that adage um, uh, takes hold and I think we just all need to be cognizant of that fact and we have to approach this planning for what it is. You do your best, all right? You can't predict all of the outcomes, um, but you work with their team, do your best and, and uh, then hope for the best to a certain degree, okay? All right, let's see if I can get my controller here. All right, tonight what we're gonna do uh, is the way that I've kind of set this up is uh, if one of you or your families came into my office, how would we go about this effectively? Um, well, like any good lawyer, the first thing I would present you with, I guess, is an agenda. Uh, my predecessor, that's how he taught me to do it, and if nothing else, it allows you know, captive clients to start checking off in their head when they're going to get the hell out of my office because I'm boring them to death. I'm kidding. But always uh, we start with the facts. And um, that's the most important thing. Dave described it as listening. Uh, Randy has always described it as listening. But it's about the intake. You can't plan unless you know the facts, all right? And you know the objectives, what the client wants, what they uh, desire. Um, uh, to achieve. Secondly, uh, I've kind of coined this phrase, rules of the game. That's code for tax talk, all right? So when we get to that portion of the agenda here tonight, get to the bar and get your drink. Kidding, it's, it's pretty straightforward stuff. It's not rocket science. I'm going to cover a, a, a few basic uh, fundamental tax things that everybody in this room needs to know. Um, and then we will move on to what I call the planning challenges. That's after we marry the facts to kind of the tax rules uh, and we address some of the challenges and we come up with some solutions that we're going to talk about here. Um, the solutions section I could spend a night on, um, but I've distilled it down really to kind of five concepts that um, we'll click through pretty quickly, but I think will resonate with probably everybody in this room, uh, the solutions will. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the solution vehicles. You know, we'll talk in the abstract about this great plan or plans, but you know, how do we deliver that? You know, in the old days we were left to you know, wills. Now we use these things called the irrevocable and revocable trusts with acronyms such as IDGIT and GRATS and CRUTS and CRATS. Bottom line is it's pretty simple. Uh, we as attorneys I think just sometimes like to make it more complicated than it really is. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the overlay of insurance, utilization of it, indications. It's not always called for, but in certain circumstances, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm just going to give you just kind of a broad overview because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, and Randy may correct me uh, if I uh, overstate or understate things here. But I think it's important that everybody have a little bit of an understanding of how insurance typically fits into this sort of planning. Then the last thing we'll do, uh, and hopefully you won't uh, kick me off the stage before then, is we'll talk about kind of the team players, you know, the people that are going to implement the plan that you all ultimately come up with, all right? So that's the agenda. Let's meet Bill and Betty, all right? Here's our facts that we're going to work off of tonight, all right? Bill and Betty, they're in their early 60s. They live on a farm outside of Gretna, about 1,200 acres, let's call it, all right? They've got four children, uh, Billy, Larry, uh, Jackie, and Megan. Billy and Larry, the two boys you see there, they're farmers. They farm with Dad, with Bill. Uh, they each have two kids, two boys by Billy, uh, two girls by Larry. Uh, Jackie's a nurse, a couple of kids herself, a boy and a girl. And then we've got Megan, who's a housewife, uh, a boy and a girl. Assets of Bill and Betty. Uh, fairly typical, um, well, typical or, or not, this is kind of how we set it up. We've got a 1,200-acre farm. We've, you know, uh, rounded up to about 10,000 an acre, I guess, and uh, let's call it a $12 million farm. Equipment, maybe another half a million dollars. Unsold grain, call it a million. CDs, 500,000 for a total of about 14 million in assets and no debt. Sorry, Lucas and Aaron. They work on a 50-50 crop share uh, arrangement with the boys, and they have stated to me um, that their objectives, primary number one objective of Bill and Betty is to take care of each other, right? to treat their children fairly. 
right? That's kind of the, uh, the crux of this whole thing. Be fair to your children. And this is typically the issue uh, where most farm families kind of lose their stamina because this is the hard question. What is fair? All right, is fair equal? I don't know. We're going to talk about that, and we'll sit and, and visit about that in a minute here. They want to keep the farm and the family and preserve the farming opportunities for the future. All right? And then, of course, um, they want to minimize or eliminate, uh, to the extent possible, uh, taxes, uh, particularly estate and gift taxes. All right? So that's the lay of the land, Bill and Betty and their four kids. All right. So Bill and Betty are in my office, uh, and this is where I uh, spring on them that we're going to go to tax school for about five minutes. Okay? The tax rules that we're going to talk about here uh, are not income taxes. All right? These are federal estate and gift taxes and generation skipping transfer taxes, which are beyond the scope of this discussion. But it's a three sort of tiered tax system. We're going to focus on the first two, federal estate and gift tax. All right? I say we have some clarity, I say that with a bit of an asterisk. I mean, we don't exactly know what's going to happen in all candor. When I get down to my cheap commentary here in a second, that's where I'm going to make my bet with everybody in the room about what I think is going to happen. Um, I've never been right before, but I, I, I think I'm going to be right about this, and you'll understand why here in a second. Point is, is that the taxes are really a dynamic sort of situation. We, we've extended the credit, the exemption, uh, you know, uh, to its 2012 levels through whenever. There's no time limit on, on the way the current law reads, but um, I think something's going to happen here eventually. All right. Before you can understand these three rules that I think you need to be familiar with to better understand kind of the planning alternatives that are out there for you, all right? You need to understand uh, three basic rules. Well, you need to understand uh, what a federal estate or gift tax is. All right? So I'm going to make it very simple. A federal estate tax, very simply, is a tax on the transfer of property at somebody's death, thus estate, all right, to somebody other than a spouse and above a certain threshold. Tax on the transfer at death, transfer of property at death to somebody other than your spouse and above a certain threshold. The value of the property exceeds a certain threshold. All right? Gift tax, very similarly, uh, is a tax on the transfer of property not at death, but at life. All right? A gift to somebody, again, other than your spouse and above a certain threshold. All right? That's a federal estate and gift tax. These rules will all tie into that definition. Okay? First rule you need to understand when you're dealing with federal estate and gift taxes is the rule called the unlimited marital deduction. All right? This rule, very simply, says transfers between spouses at life for gift tax purposes or at death for estate tax purposes are absolutely free. Be it one, be it one dollar or one trillion dollars that you're transferring at life or death between spouses, we can never generate an estate or gift tax. Well, we can, but we'd really have to screw something up to do it. All right? Sometimes we do it intentionally, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion here, all right? So the unlimited marital deduction, transfers between spouses at life or at death are absolutely free, never subject to tax, all right? Sounds like a pretty good rule, right? All right, like any good tax attorney, I have one subpart rule, all right? And that's, we'll call it rule 1A. It's called the unlimited charitable deduction. This rule very basically says that transfers uh, to qualifying charities for gift or estate tax purposes are also absolutely free. All right? We cannot create a tax. And qualifying charities, you know it when you see it. Basically, they're tax-exempt organization. All right? Now, you might get a nice income tax deduction if you make that transfer during life, but we're not talking about income taxes tonight. All right? That's rule number one. Pretty simple. Transfers between spouses at life or at death are absolutely free. We can't generate a tax. All right? Rule number two, uh, and if you go back to my definition on rule number one, it says a federal estate tax is a tax on the transfer of property to somebody other than your spouse. That's the other than your spouse part, all right? Rule number two, all right, the exemption amount, if you go back to my definition, if you're transferring property to somebody other than your spouse, think children, grandchildren, whoever it is, a tax could be due if it exceeds a certain threshold, I said. Threshold is what I refer to here as the exemption amount. That's the amount that you can leave to somebody other than your spouse before the tax exists. All right? And this is where all the hubbub and play has been in the media and in DC 
uh, over the last two years. Presently, where we sit tonight, January 23rd, uh, 2013, the exemption per person uh, is 5.25 million indexed for inflation. And the way the law currently reads is that it will be indexed every year, so the expectation is that 5.25 will go up, you know, bit by bit uh, over the ne each year, all right? The thing about this exemption that's, that's quite interesting um, is that there is now this concept called portability of exemption. And what that means very simply is that either spouse has the ability to use at life or at death the other spouse's exemption, full exemption, all right? So if first spouse left everything to surviving spouse on their death, all right, what do we know about that transfer? It's free, right? Unlimited marital deduction, all right? But when the surviving spouse dies, all right, the surviving spouse has the ability to transfer to their children, all right, not just their $5.125 million of credit, but they can go back into the grave and pick out the deceased spouse, the predeceased spouse, $5.125 million exemption for a total of $10.25 million. Up until uh, 2011, that wasn't possible. There was this concept surrounding the exemption that if you didn't use your exemption, you'd lose it, all right? So the real nice benefit about the law right now and the way the exemption reads is that the, the, the second to die spouse can go back into the grave of the deceased spouse and use the exemption. So you never waste your exemption, theoretically, which is kind of a nice feature. All right, so what I want you to know about that is that currently where we sit, farm families can transfer assets totaling 10.25 million to the next generation pretty simply without tax consequence. To the extent you have assets greater than 10.25 million in value, all right, the next dollar is taxed at the low, low rate of 40%. All right? Every dollar thereafter is hit at 40%. If you go back to Bill and Betty, all right, and that was by design, Bill and Betty have $14 million. So they're about $4 million over the exemption. So simple math will tell you at 40%, absent some additional planning, they're looking at about a million six in taxes, all right, down the road. And that assumes their estate doesn't grow or appreciate uh, over the intervening years, okay? All right, last rule. All right, I told you this wasn't terribly difficult, all right? And if anybody has any questions, just shout it out, because it's my job to make sure you kind of have an understanding of this, because this is the setup for kind of the, the, the rest of the planning here. Most of you have heard of probably rule number three, all right? In addition to everybody in this room being able to transfer 5.125 million, all right, at life or at death to somebody other than a spouse, annually each of us now has the ability in 2013 to transfer $14,000 per year to an unlimited number of people, all right? So between a husband and wife, presently, today, January 23rd, 2013, each parent in this room could gift, without tapping into this exemption, that $5.125 million, $28,000 a year, all right? And that's annually renewable. You get it every year, all right? Those are the rules of the game, all right? We know what uh, Betty and uh, Bob want to do, and uh, we're going to layer those facts into these rules here in a second to come up with a plan, all right? Now I'm going to give you my cheap commentary on what I think is going to happen with the taxes, all right? Anybody out there, all right, uh, and if you get this right within a million dollars, all right, uh, my partner Dave will buy you a drink at the bar, all right? <laughs> Does anybody have a guess as to what the total amount of revenue generated right, by federal estate and gift taxes in the year 2011 or 2012. Total revenue generated by this tax regime, federal tax regime, estate and gift taxes. Throw out a number. 800 what? 800 million? Anybody else? 500 million. Anybody else? Eight billion? In 2011, all right, it was close, Randy. Actually, you're, you're, you're on it. Dave owes you a drink, all right? In 2011, all right, 
Total revenue generated by federal, estate, and gift taxes was $7.5 billion. For 2012, they're projecting it to be $11.5 billion. All right, a billion's a lot of money, all right, um, but it's not that much. To put it in perspective for you, that revenue, $11.5 billion or $7.5 billion, whatever the number you want to use, will not cover the interest on our $3.2 trillion debt for one day. Okay? For one day. Right? What's the point I'm making here? It's a throwaway tax. It's an absolute throwaway tax. All right? $11.5 billion, $7.5 billion, seems like a lot of money. All right? Here's the play. Oh, the, the current presidential administration has made no secret that they want to increase income tax rates. And what I thought was going to happen, and I thought there was a movement uh, behind this, was that um, as kind of a loss leader and in recognition of the fact that the, the federal estate tax really does not generate that much in revenue, the thought was is that President Obama would maybe appear to reach across the aisle and say, all right, I'm going to get rid of the federal estate and gift tax regime in exchange for an increase on the income tax rates. Right? And what that would uh, ostensibly uh, uh, look like for him would be that he's kind of a compromising sort. He's reaching across to a, a Republican disfavored tax, eliminating it, and in exchange asking for an increase in the income taxes. Why would he do that? Well, as I've said, it's an $11.5 billion revenue source, which is nothing in this day and age. Uh, but there's another reason why that makes a lot of sense, okay? When somebody dies, you need to understand the income tax consequences, and I, I don't want to get too off on this, but I want you all in this room to be aware of this, because I really think this could happen here in the next four years. And I think it'll pick up some traction in the media here shortly. When somebody dies owning a family farm, for example, okay, let's say it's under the $10 million federal estate tax limit. So federal estate taxes apply right now, but let's say you got an $8 million farm, all right? And let's assume that your cost basis in that farm, that is what you paid for it, right, was a uh, million dollars, okay? Land was cheap when you bought it, it appreciated over the years, or when you inherited it, whatever the case might be. If you went and sold that farm today, all right, for $8 million, it's fair market value, for income tax purposes, you'd have what? A $7 million capital gain, right? And on that $7 million capital gain, you'd pay, uh, let's call it 27% with federal and state income tax, okay? Change the facts. Under our current regime, where we have federal estate taxes, which don't apply in my example, because we're under the limit, which most people are, all right? If we eliminate the federal, or uh, under the current regime, if you die owning it, what happens to that basis in that farm property on the death of the owner? It goes from a million dollars to what? Eight million dollars, all right? So that when the heirs inherit that property, a state tax-free, because it's under the exemption, they also inherit an asset that's got a stepped-up basis, which means if they turn around and sold it, they wouldn't pay 27% tax on $7 million, all right? So think about this. If they get rid of the federal estate and gift tax, guess what also goes away? The step up in basis. Hello, all right? You think that's gonna generate a little bit more revenue than 11.5 billion? Everybody in this country that dies and that has appreciated property in their estate, be it stocks, you know, uh, real estate, uh, you know, personal property, guess what the government gets on that? 27%, or 20, you know, between state and federal governments. Kind of ingenious, right? And think about this. People that are inheriting money would have uh, a, a less difficult time paying tax on property that didn't occur until they sold it. I mean, meaning it's found money in, in a lot of circumstances. That's how people view inheritance, not in this context in the farm planning, but think about that. I can assure you that the revenue generated by that simple little maneuver will be far greater, you know, 20-fold of the 11.5 billion that the current regime generates, all right? You heard it here first, all right? I will bet you, all right, in the next four years, 
uh, that will become a reality. And it's just simple math, folks. I mean, at the end of the day, at 3.2 trillion in debt, federal estate taxes do not cover one day of interest on that debt. And we're gonna have to increase taxes beyond where they are currently. And I think this is a real nifty way to do it and to appear painless or to appear, uh, to make it appear as if, um, you know, uh, somebody's being thrown a bone, the affluent, all right? It's a throwaway. All right, so it's my commentary, it's cheap, it's what you paid for it, so. But just file that away in the back of your head, all right? If I'm right, then you owe me a beer the next time I'm in town, so. All right. If I had to distill down, um, uh, you know, over the course of the last two years, I got a lot of on-the-job training, all right? Because people were in a big hurry knowing that that exemption level, which is at five million, was scheduled to reduce back down to a million dollars, all right? So it was kind of a lawyer's nirvana, tax lawyer's nirvana when you think about it. We have an impending deadline, a cliff, uh, and, if you don't, and we had no idea what was gonna happen one way or another, so safe money, all right, was to go ahead and do some planning while you're alive to lock in that $5 million exemption that was last year and that we didn't know if it was gonna be around for another year. All right? So one of the big issues that you're presented with as farm families and, and we as planners are now presented with is that um, do you engage now that we have some, quote, permanency uh, in a lifetime gifting strategy, all right, or do you do a testamentary strategy? And what I mean by that, a testamentary strategy is do we implement your succession plan, your business transition plan, strictly with your estate planning documents, your basic estate planning documents, which we can do, or do we kind of continue on with what we've been doing for the last two years and consider trying to do this planning, the tax planning side of this now, all right? Well, what are the pros and cons to the two strategies, all right? Well, the pros to a lifetime gifting strategy are, are many, but the two significant ones that I've outlined here is that if you gift five million or 10 million of assets, which you have the ability to do, think farm ground, for example, at this point in time, once you make that gift, all right, that asset is no longer subject to your creditor claims because you don't own it, right? Now, if you gift it outright to your kids, which is not what I'm advocating at all here, it's subject to their creditors' claims, which may be way more dangerous when you think about it, but there are some devices that we would use to implement a lifetime gifting strategy, namely irrevocable trust, which I'll talk about here in a minute, that will afford the parents, in my example, Bill and Betty, the ability to get those assets out of their estate, not just the 10 million, but what the 10 million grows to, and that's the rub, that escapes taxes down the road, um, and it protects them from creditors' claims, all right? Protects those assets from their creditors and from their kids' creditors. And so that's still gonna be a viable strategy regardless of what happens to the taxes, all right? Second pro uh, is, and I touched on it already, is that it is, uh, lifetime planning uh, affords individuals um, from a tax perspective, it's the ultimate in estate and gift tax efficiency, all right? Because as I said just a second ago, when you transfer or engage in a lifetime planning process, uh, which is what we've been doing predominantly for the last two years, um, it's not the 10 million that you shift to the next generation using your exemptions that passes tax-free. It's what that 10 million grows to, all right, over the course of you and your spouse's lives that passes tax-free, all right? So it's kind of the time value of money. If you shift farm ground, all right, and the income associated with that farm ground, all right, or the growth on the value of the underlying assets, all of that, all right, is, is out of your estate from the date that you make the transfer. If you wait until death and do that, all right, your farm ground and all of the proceeds derived from it, be in the form of rent or crop share, um, you know, grain, unsold grain, all of that's still included in your estate, all right? And so you're only limit, you're limited to the 10 million and your estate grew beyond that, all right? So those are the pros to lifetime gifting versus kind of a testamentary strategy. The cons, and this I dealt with a lot uh, with farm families over the course of the last two years. You gotta get your head wrapped around this, all right? If you're gonna do a lifetime gift, all right, gift is just kind of what it connotes. I mean, you're moving it out of your name and moving it into someone else's name, all right? 
and there are some income tax consequences associated with that. Um, uh, there's all kinds of, of uh, different pieces, parts. There's potential cash flow impediments. There's potential loss of basis step up because if you make a gift, all right, and then you die, that property doesn't get a basis step up going back to the income tax stuff. So there are a lot of things that we factor into the equation, but by and large, we have solutions for all of this. So I'm still a strong advocate, and I'll get into this and it'll make some more sense here in a minute, of, of utilizing a lifetime strategy. Of course, you still have to have basic estate planning documents, but very strong arguments can be made for lifetime gifting, even with the uncertainty out there in the tax law, all right? All right, if I had to boil the last two years working with farm and ranching families uh, down to uh, kind of the, the quintessential or penultimate, that's a lawyer word, issue. It's about getting families to this point, all right, talking about the taxes and explaining to them the various strategies that we can employ. It's getting them to this point and having them tell me what their view of fair is. Because if you remember, going back to Bill and Betty's objectives, they said they want to take care of each other, the spouses, first and foremost. And then secondly, they want to be fair to their kids, all right? Well, more often than not, when I'm working with farm families, what we're dealing with, all right, are kind of, uh, you know, broken families. When, and by that, I just simply mean some farm, some don't, all right? So how do we unscramble that egg, all right? And that, in my opinion, has been the biggest impediment uh, historically for farm families trying to get this done because they don't have the answer. Right? or they don't want to think about it because it kind of hurts. Um, and they're fearful of maybe what their kids may think or of not being fair. Um, bottom line, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but we have some solutions. And the idea here tonight, I want to spend a little bit of time on that very specific issue of how we go about dealing. What are the options? I mean, you're limited only by your imagination, but in doing this uh, intensively for the last 24 months, and, and we did this with countless families, um, I've kind of distilled down the potential solutions into five buckets, all right? We're gonna go on to that next here. And then the last challenge, of course, are taxes, but um, I, I feel very confident as a tax lawyer that we've got solutions to minimize taxes the best we can. Um, and so that one just doesn't give me a lot of heartburn. It's the non-tax one determining what is fair and how to deal with that uh, that, that gets everybody hung up. All right, so what are some potential planning strategies and philosophies to deal with fairness, okay? And these are kind of my uh, personal terms that I've coined here, all right? Of course, of the last 17 years of doing this, farm families usually fall in one of these buckets in defining what fair is, okay? First one is what my family did, all right? My grandma and grandpa with my mom and my uncle, two kids. My mom didn't farm, she was a nurse. Uh, my uncle farmed, still farms. And my grandma and grandpa took the approach that fair was equal, meaning I don't care, Lynette, that you didn't farm, you became a nurse. Um, and Larry, I don't care that you farmed the whole time you're both my kids, and my view of the world is we're going to split it equally, and then you guys figure it out, all right? We had, I don't know how many meetings to discuss that, and the idea was, I mean, that's what I do, right? Uh, I failed my family, let me tell you. Um, we had many meetings. My grandfather um, survived my grandmother, and um, everybody knew what was coming. We invited input, discussion, dialogue. And my grandma and grandpa were very adamant that that was the result that they wanted, all right? Well, my grandpa passed away at 92, I don't know, probably five or so years ago. And I love my uncle. Um, uh, he was a fabulous man to me growing up. I spent a lot of summers out there on the farm and uh, tormenting uh, his daughters and everything else on a three-wheeler. And, um, but what happened uh, was interesting, and this goes back to what I said earlier. You can plan, but you can't always predict what's going to happen or what the outcome is. All right, and that's just life experience. 
grandfather died, um, and of course, uh, I handled the administration of his estate, um, which went fairly efficiently. Um, we had things titled the right way. Um, and then we had to do the deeds out of the trust to split the property. And you know, I sensed, and as an estate planner, you, you have to be perceptive to kind of what people are thinking, or at least be able to maybe kind of read what they're thinking, or you know, if they're giving you the hairy eyeball, or you, know, you just kind of have to, 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 to be perceptive. And I just got the sense that something wasn't right. And my mom uh, had every intention, and in fact did, at that meeting when we were kind of signing some paperwork to divvy it up, uh, said to Larry, you know, Larry, if you want to buy this, you know, whatever we valued it for, uh, you know, tax purposes, you know, you can buy it. I mean, that's fine. This is your deal. And uh, he said, I don't want to buy it. And, um, you know, he was pretty adamant about that. And, and uh, my mom said, well, I don't plan on selling it. Pops told me not to sell it. And so my intention is to keep it. And um, would you manage it? And pretty quickly, he said, no, I'm not going to manage it. Um, I don't want to manage it. I'm going to, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, you know. And, I, and we left that meeting. We divided the property up. And my mom called me up and said, did I miss something there? And I said, I don't think you missed anything. And I said, I don't think I'd read anything into it, quite frankly. I think I'd just sit tight, uh, see what happens. Let's talk to um, my cousins, her nieces, and, um, you know, see what happens. Well, it, it, it hasn't been what I would call an absolutely happy ending. Right? And I'm not advocating that you shouldn't do the fair is equal you know, sort of uh, arrangement. Um, but there is um, very disparate views on that, from the non, obviously from the non-farming non -farming family member to the farming family member. And I'm very appreciative of my uncle's view of the world. I mean, he worked the land, he stayed there, had to deal with my grandpa uh, you know, day in and day out. Um, and there's an affinity to that land that um, I, I think genuinely, uh, and, and not to snub my mom because he loves her dearly, uh, I, I think he just, it, it wasn't right with him. Um, and, and I don't think it will ever be right. So I, I share that experience with you because, you know, we think we can come up with all these solutions. I, I, I think that's certainly a viable solution, and these are all family specific. Um, but be careful, you never know, all right? I think we could have done better, though, all right? Next one, fair is equal plus, all right? It's the functional equivalent of split it equal, all right? Let everybody figure it out on their own. But it kind of mandates that right of first refusal or option in the farming member, the, the, the family member that farms. Meaning, you put into the documents that the farming uh, family member, farming child, has the right to buy, all right? Commercially reasonable terms, or, if the other child goes to sell it, they get a right of first refusal, meaning they can match that offer, right? Um, you know, that's probably better than the top one, quite frankly, right? In my personal experience, that's what my mother ended up doing, but uh, it, it didn't happen. All right, then you go to the other end of the continuum here, right? And I, I've got a great example, and that's kind of where uh, Bill and Betty um, Brown came to mind, and, and, and this example was derived from. Um, farm families first, meaning it's the anti-fair is equal sort of sentiment. It's kind of in line with, I think, what my uncle's beliefs were. Had some clients uh, up in uh, west central Iowa, kind of by where my, my uh, uh, mom grew up, uh, and ironically knew my family, or my mom's family. And they had about 1,200 acres, had it appraised, valued, I don't know, north of, uh, well, 12 million, let's call it, all right? Four kids, just like in our example here. Um, two of the boys farmed, two girls did not. One was a nurse, one was a homemaker, all right? Kenny, um, who is also known as Bill in my example here, all right? Um, when we got to this point in the planning process, um, was very, very adamant about the boys getting the farm ground, okay? In the case of Kenny um, and Theo, uh, they didn't have 14 million. They had 12 million of ground and they had about a, a million dollar life insurance policy, which is important because we're gonna come back to that in a minute, which was earmarked for the girls. And then they had some unsold grain, about half a million of equipment, et cetera. Um, Kenny viewed that the equipment would go to the boys. The boys would get the land. 
um, the girls would split the million dollar insurance policy and we'd call it good, all right? Well, I went through this kind of line item uh, with them on, on two separate occasions. Uh, his wife wasn't so sure she was good with that and we probably had three sessions on this deal and, and as a planner, I had to be very careful, you know, I had my own opinion because I had a mom that was on the other side of this and, you know, you don't want to inject kind of what your personal belief or experience is. I shared it with them um, and I just tried to give them the opposite perspective as a planner. I think that's what we can do sometimes. You can't tell your clients what to do. It has to be their plan and they have to own it. Um, and we gave them a couple of these other options, which I'll talk about here in a second, but at the end of the day, all right, what they came back to is the boys, in my example, they're going to get 12 million a ground and the girls are going to get a half million each in life insurance proceeds. Um, and that's it. They farmed it. It's going to stay in their families. They're going to have family farmers. So that's at the other end of the continuum. All right? Again, not a right or wrong answer, but that was the answer that family determined uh, was right for them. This one here uh, is my favorite, all right, quite frankly, because I think it solves for both ends of the continuum here. You know, the fair is equal group and the farm family's first group. How does this work? And we've been developing this over the last 18, 24 months. I call it the clawback. What does that mean? Well, it incorporates the best of fair, fair is equal and farm families first, all right? The clawback is a concept that basically says, all right, if we've got farmers in the family, and you remember Billy and, um, uh, uh, Bill and Betty's uh, objective was to keep the farm in the family as long as possible to preserve the ability to farm for future generations, okay? Well, what the clawback does is, is essentially accomplishes that, but it also takes care of the fair is equal crowd if that philosophy somewhere gets lost generationally. Here's what, how it works. With the clawback, the initial split on death of the parents, right, whether we invoke lifetime planning or death planning, testamentary planning, is that the farm goes to the farm families, all right, meaning they're farming it, they get to do it. But then there's a couple of caveats, all right, that's what I call the clawback, all right. The caveats are, all right, is that if that property is sold, all right, at any time, all right, everybody participates. Right? In my example, the two girls would participate right? if it was sold or if people stop actively farming the ground, meaning they go to a cash rent sort of regime. Right? In that circumstance, the philosophy that somebody in the family, whoever they are, another generation below, is not farming it. All right? And the philosophy that farm families will tell you, the reason they go that route, is because it's not a commodity. The ground is not a commodity. It's not to be sold, right? Well, if it is sold, then it did become a commodity, right? And the concept is everybody should share equally, no matter what generation we're at, right? So that kind of, in my opinion, solves for a lot of the consternation, all right? If the land is sold and that $12 million is realized, you know, I mean, the boys could say, heck, let's go to Florida. Let's cash this out. You know, Larry and Billy could say that. Uh, and then the girls got 500,000, the boys got 12 million. It defeated the whole purpose. This protects against that. But if they're going to farm it, all right, by God, they get to farm it. And they get to derive the income from it and kind of deals with that overall or overarching philosophy. It's really kind of a nifty concept. Um, and again, not right for everybody, but another possibility. All right, then the last one. And, and this one's been out there for quite a while. The, the, the farm families aren't first, but they control. This is where you will see, you know, uh, families forming limited liability companies or partnerships and effectively splitting and, and putting the land and the farming operation in one or more LLCs <clears throat> um, and effectively giving all of the family members equal stock ownership percentage in that entity. But giving the active farming members control of the entity. And we'd incorporate buy-sell provisions that would basically allow the farming members to, to buy that stock back from the non-farming uh, family member 
at using a predetermined formula or price with predetermined terms. Um, uh, it would allow the non-farming members to put what we call force the farming members uh, to buy them out after some period of time, because after all, it's in inher their inheritance and they might want to liquidate it. Um, you know, that one's been around for a while, but it's still very effective, all right? The only downside to that one is it's kind of your threshold for complexity, because again, it upsets the apple cart a little bit with typically how people and a lot of farmers operate, which is very informally, you know, for the most part. Um, and the, all of a sudden, we inject a lot of formality uh, into that strategy. But it is effective, um, and it does accomplish kind of both camps. So that's the benefit of 17 years right there, working with farming families. That's what I've distilled it down to. Now, you know, I'm sure there are other things on the list, and we've done many variations of that. But if I had to group it together in buckets, that's what we'd be talking about there. And that issue, getting to heart of that issue for most families, uh, is the hard part, all right? And guess what? It doesn't involve any taxes or any sort of complicated planning. It's just about figuring out what's right for you and your family. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna click through these pretty quickly, but I, I told you that whatever philosophy or disposition strategy, going back to this last side, that families decide on, we've got a couple of different vehicles to get that done, all right? Solution vehicle, this is number, the, the first one. This, this encapsulates kind of a lifetime planning strategy. And this is what we did a ton of over the last 24 months. We call these dual legacy trusts. And very simply, the concept is this, all right? And it's, it's actually, as I've been a lawyer, uh, as long as I've been a lawyer, this is as close to having your proverbial cake and eating it too as we've ever gotten, all right? It's pretty amazing. It's a pretty nifty little technique. Um, but again, there is some, you know, shake up to the way you're normally doing things and it's getting people comfortable with that that was the impediment uh, oftentimes to getting it actually done. But here's the concept, very simply, okay? This invokes a, a, a lifetime planning strategy where effectively mom and dad, Bill and Betty in my example, would take their 10 million of their 12 million of ground, get it valued, split it equally between the two of them, and each of them would create a trust. Bill would create a trust for the benefit of Benny, uh, Betty and the four kids. And Betty would create a trust for the benefit of Bill and the four kids. Okay, so kind of these cross trusts. We call them dual legacy trusts, all right? So in Bill's trust, he'd throw his half million of, of real estate uh, and he would make Betty the trustee of that trust. Or think of a trust just as a bucket. Empty bucket waiting to get assets, all right? Into that bucket, we drop the land, we do some deeds, we get it valued, $5 million, all right? Betty would be the carrier of that bucket, the trustee, meaning she would have the right to dip into it and take out whatever it is she needed, all right, during her life, subject to some standard, okay? Likewise, all right, the trust that Betty created for Bill, Bill would be the trustee of it, all right? Now, I'm oversimplifying this, but this is the concept, okay? So what have we done there, all right? For tax purposes, they made a completed gift of that $10 million of real estate. But guess what? By and through each other, right, they retain access during their lifetimes to that ground, right? By virtue of the fact that they're trustees and lifetime beneficiaries over that trust, right? So it's out of their estates for tax purposes, right? They have access to it during their lives, and then when they die, Right? On a tax-free basis, everything drops down and we implement whatever philosophy or strategy that I was just talking about, equal, um, all of the farm kids, you know, whatever it is, right? that's what happens down in here. Um, what are the advantages to this structure? I, they're too numerous to mention, but I highlighted a couple of them earlier. Soon as mom and dad drop this property into these trusts, they're protected from creditors, all right? the plaintiff's lawyer, if you will. All right? Uh, not only uh, their kids' as creditors, but their creditors, asset protected, all right? Moreover, as that land grows, all right, and earns income, because typically we'll carry over the crop share arrangement into these trusts, all right? It gets all of the, all of the proceeds from the farming operation, continues to grow and swell. Third benefit, who pays the income taxes on that grain, 
on that sold you know, from the farming operation. Well, the way these trusts are set up, all right, is that mom and dad still pay the income taxes. So these trusts just get fat, 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 fat. Mom and dad carry the tax rate on it, which is effectively another gift each year, the tax liability. Uh, that's another benefit. Fourth or fifth benefit, whatever you put in this trust, all right, and whatever it grows to stays in trust linearly from generation to generation, right? And we make, and, and Randy asked, I specifically touch on this, the way we design it is each generation, so after mom and dad are gone, the kids, however many there are, get their own little bucket. They become their own, you know, if we do an equal split, for example, they carry their own bucket, all right? And the nice thing about this is that those assets are not included in your kids' estate. Right, for tax, for the purpose of calculating their own taxes. The government is perpetually cheated out of, out of that asset and deriving the state and gift tax revenue off of that asset, so long as it stays in trust linearly. So your kids take out of it what they need, kind of like coupons, all right? It's in trust during their lifetime. They're trustees of the trust. They have access to it for whatever they need, all right? And then they get to make a decision when they die how it splits between their kids, all right? and on and on and on, all right? And it's creditor protected, it's spouse protected from you know, an unsavory in-law, all right? As long as it sits in that trust, it can go on for generations, all right? I'm a huge advocate of this, even if, even if, and I'm hoping that they do, um, get rid of the federal estate and gift tax. We still have the creditor protection, we still have uh, all of the asset protection, we still have the thoughtful distribution of that farm through your family, uh, and there's tons of flexibility built into this. Okay. Yeah. What is lots of my flexibility is everything. Talk about the ability for the family to in thirty one exchange exchange assets in the trust in thirty one. Yeah. What? Whoops. Going back the wrong way here. One of the other, and I'm, and I'm hitting the high level stuff, but one of the real interesting things about this, all right, if you go back to what I said earlier, and this is kind of what Randy was touching on, I, I said that these trusts, uh, the, the parents pay the income taxes on the income earned by these trusts, all right? We call them grantor defective trusts or intentionally defective grantor trusts, IGITS, it's the acronym. Intentionally defective grantor trusts, or the acronym is IDGT, we call it IGITS, all right? It's one of those acronyms that attorneys come up with that nobody understands. But all that says is that mom and dad, even though they've made a, a transfer, a legal transfer of that property for gift tax purposes and estate tax purposes, they still get the federal income tax bill annually. All right? And the way that we make that happen is through some provisions that we have in the trust, one of which, and Randy was alluding to this, is what we call a power to substitute assets. Okay. These trusts are incredibly flexible. So let's just say mom and dad throw the ground in there, throw the ground in there, um, and they're tired of paying income taxes without getting the actual income themselves, right? One thing they can do is they can take those assets back out of the trust and replace it with other assets of equal value. Power to substitute, right? That level of control makes it taxable for income tax purposes to mom and dad. But it's also an incredibly efficient way to grab that property back if they don't want it in there, or if it's growing too big, or if they've got fam uh, problems in the family. Um, they can take it back out and just put a promissory note in there, equal to the value of the ground that they pull out on the date they pull it out, right? It's pretty granular, and I don't want to get too far off on that tangent, but all I will say about this strategy, folks, is that uh, in my 17 years and in some of my partners who are older than I, there's never been anything like it. I mean, in terms of a platform, uh, it's, it's like having your cake and eating it too. You give it away, you still control it indirectly, right? Uh, it passes lineal ta linearly tax-free, it's creditor protected, um, and it's the thoughtful distribution of a very uh, uh, sacred asset, your farm, uh, over time, all right? That's during life, all right? And I'll skip through that, and this is kind of the background on that, and if, if you want some more information on that, we can certainly get it to you. The second solution vehicle to implement a plan, and I said this earlier, was you just do it at death, all right? 
that works, all right, in certain circumstances, all right? If we have a pretty good feel that you're going to be under the exemption levels, you know, the $10 million, um, the nice thing about doing it is death, at death is what? Uh, you get a basis step up on top of it. If you're under the threshold, this trust here, it's kind of a two trust structure, but it's effectively the trust I just went over that springs into existence on death. Husband and wife would each have one, uh, just like they did it during life. The nice thing about doing it at death, assuming that we're, the assets haven't grown beyond the federal estate tax exemption, um, is that you get the basis step up or the next generation for income tax purposes. But if you go back to this slide, all right, even though you're making a gift, and when you make that gift of the land during your life over, the basis doesn't get stepped up when you die. If you go back to my power to substitute assets, we have the ability to kind of time that. So if we knew somebody was sick, mom and dad could grab that property back out and own it individually, stick a note in, when they die, you get a basis step up in the ground. And then we stuff it back in after death. So there's all kinds of funny little tricks of the trade that, that we as uh, tax lawyers have come up with, you know, to, and I say this loosely, and I'm being filmed and it's bad, uh, to cheat the government out of their taxes, but to cheat them fairly. It's the rules, it's within the law. So, all right, those are the two strategies. I don't understand, what's the second strategy? Second strategy is, is the exact same thing as the first strategy, but it doesn't take effect until you die. Instead of creating that trust during lifetime, you hold the assets, go about your business, just like you've always been, and then when you die, all right, that trust gets funded, all right? And, you know, you lose the benefit uh, of um, keeping the growth on those assets out of your estate, because that's all in your estate if you don't do it during your lifetime. It's always subject to your creditors, you know, because you own it personally. Um, and, uh, it, uh, I mean, that's the primary difference, quite frankly. You do get the basis step up, but basically it's the exact same strategy if you implemented it during your life. All of this hocus pocus up here just deals with all kinds of other assets, but if you, if you broke all that off and you just really looked at this box, it's the functional equivalent of what we did during lifetime. It just happens at death, all right? But it's less disruptive to your operations, you know, uh, and if you're gonna be under that $10 million threshold, um, it's, it's a good strategy, it's a very good strategy. Less hassle, allows you to do what you've been doing without thinking about it, and because I will tell you, there, you gotta get used to the strategy if you do it during your life. It takes some getting used to and some coaching, and unfortunately, you'll have to deal with, you know, uh, you know an accountant and a lawyer probably more regularly than you want, um, but the upside uh, is all there. Does that make sense, a little bit? All right, we're getting close here. All right, insurance. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not an insurance salesman, I just play one on TV. Um, insurance um, uh, is a godsend, all right, quite frankly, in a lot of this planning process, all right? A lot of times people though, um, for whatever reason, um, they just don't get insurance and how it interplays here. And it's a pretty simple concept, right? And the two indications where it, it makes a lot of sense uh, in the estate planning or the business succession planning arena are for equalization. Go back to my farmers, or Bill and Betty in this example, uh, that adopted, you know, farm family's first strategy, okay? Well, if they had thought about that early on and were insurable, um, one way to deal with that uh, perceived economic inequality that maybe people are thinking about, insure over it, right? Meaning in a perfect world, mom and dad would have 12 million of farm ground and 12 million of other assets. Well, that's a lot of assets, but insurance allows for leveraging of dollars to get big numbers, all right? That's kind of one common use of it, and we can do that on a tax-free basis, all right? So that makes a lot of sense, you know, Bill and Betty here, right? Um, the second reason uh, is one I really like. I like them both, but this one, uh, if I can crystallize it for you, amounts to this. In my example, Bill and Betty, they had 14 million of assets, right? So they can pass 10 million, all right? And in my hypothetical here, if we assume no growth, 
right? And Bill and Betty die with 14 million of assets. We calculated the tax on that at 40% to be 1.6 million, right? All right, so when they die, the survivor dies, that tax comes due. Well, where do we pay for that tax? Well, Bill and Betty had farm equipment, they had um, CDs, um, what else did they have? Grain, all right? That's where we'd pay that bill. We'd pay a million six. Any insurance agent worth his or her salt, however, could tell you, I could get you a million six of coverage or three million of coverage or five million of coverage to take into account the growth and the increase in tax bill, and I guarantee you, you'll pay less than a million six in insurance premium when it's all said and done, right? You insure against the tax liability, right? It's nothing more complicated than that, right? And that makes a lot of sense if you're, you know, uh, uh, credits and debit sort of guy or gal, as the case may be, that pencils out all day, every day. Now, the considerations, of course, all right, that layer into insurance and how much and what kind, predominant one is cash flow, all right? You got to have the cash flow. You got to be able to pay for the premium on the insurance, all right? Well, right now, I think farmers are, you know, got good cash flow, grain prices being where they are. Um, you're an ideal candidate to consider utilization of insurance for insuring over some of that tax risk if you're over uh, uh, the limit. The type, permanent term, all right? I'm not even gonna attempt to explain all the differences. Uh, permanent is largely what its name uh, uh, connotes, and that is, or denotes, it's there when you need it. You just gotta keep paying it. And depending on the product, sometimes you get to stop paying it if the, if the insurance performs, all right? And then ownership considerations, and there really aren't many considerations. You don't want to own it in your own name. You're going to own it in a trust, either in the trust that you created in this dual legacy trust structure or a separate what we call irrevocable life insurance trust or an ILET, another acronym, all right? But insurance very, very much plays into this equation, either from an equalization or a liquidity standpoint to cover the tax bill. All right, last slide. Probably the most critical next to figuring out, all right, what FAIR is in your family and that concept um, is figuring out who's going to do what. Come up with the greatest plan in the world, but if we don't implement it, all right, you're gone. That structure's not implemented. If you don't put the people in place, and specifically I'm speaking of trustees, people to manage these assets and make sure that the plan that you design gets implemented and followed, it's not worth the paper it's written on, all right? What does a trustee or a fiduciary do? Really three things, all right? They're charged, and I'm looking at a fiduciary, there's all different types of fiduciaries, but for purposes of this discussion, what I'm talking about um, is a trustee, and what do they do? Well, their, their first objective is they manage assets that are in the bucket, all right? It's farm ground. They're responsible for, you know, entering into leases, you know, structuring the crop share, whatever it is, custom farming. They're responsible for that. Insurance, you name it, all right? It's stocks and bonds. They're responsible for investing the bonds. Um, it's a big job. But preserving what's there, all right, for the trust beneficiaries. That's the trustee's first role. Second role is really kind of a, well, it's, it's a dual role, kind of the same thing, but it's accounting, all right? Receipts, disbursements. You've got to account to the beneficiaries. You're serving in a fiduciary role. You're the legal owner as the trustee, but you're not the beneficial owner, all right? So you manage the assets for the benefit of the, of the trust beneficiaries, but there's some tax accounting that goes along with that. Credits, debits, and then there's tax compliance, all right? You've got to file tax returns, all right? With these strategies comes a little bit of complexity, all right? A crazy complexity, but you got to know what you're doing. You got to be able to file fiduciary income tax returns. And then there's this one, the asset distribution. Uh, and that's probably um, the mother of all trustee functions, right? And that's basically distributing the assets in accordance <clears throat> with the, the settlers or the grant or the creator of the trust wishes, all right? Pretty heady stuff, and so picking the right person or company, as the case may be, or combination of the two, is very critical when we're talking about the, uh, the, the assets that we're talking about here, your family business, all right? The question is, as a corporate trustee or an individual trustee, 
better than the other? And I would say the answer to that, when we're dealing uh, with the sensitivity and the sacred nature of the assets that we're dealing with here, and the value and the cash flow that they present, uh, I'm a believer in a combo approach, all right? Corporate trustees, for example, Geneva, um, that are invested in the ag community and know the ag assets, do these things very well, very well, exceedingly well, all right? The individual, oftentimes a family member that would serve as potentially a co-trustee with a corporate fiduciary, right, knows the family very well and knows the dynamic, right? And in my experience, the best outcomes are when you've got those two pulling together, right? And I'm a firm believer in, in kind of a co-trustee, corporate and individual trustee, because you get the benefit of both worlds. Lucas and Aaron, for example, probably have some familiarity with a lot of the families around here. They certainly have familiarity with the farming business. Um, but chances are, they don't know the, the nitty gritty details of each of your family members and what makes them tick, right? But somebody in your family probably does, right? So that's a big deal. Last thing, and I'll get out of your hair, um, but sticking with this guidance role, a lot of these trusts and a lot of these planning tools that we're talking about here are what we call dynastic in nature, meaning they're set up to go generationally into perpetuity. Nebraska abolished this rule, called the Rule Against Perpetuities, which made all trusts end after a certain period of time. Lives in being at the time of creation of the trust, plus 22 years. Well, we've, got, we've done away with that. So now trusts can exist into perpetuity, all right? And the trust structures, whether they're set up at death or during life, are designed to go on and on and on, as long as there's assets there, as long as somebody doesn't decide to terminate the trust. When you think about that, uh, that's pretty heady stuff. And for a mom and dad, a generation way up here, all right, to be able to um, share their vision with somebody that's managing those trust assets, the fiduciary, way down here, 40, 50, 60 years down the road, what we're encouraging clients to do a lot of is to kind of develop what we call a guidance letter, right? And, and the concept there is mom and dad sit down with their favorite beverage on a cold winter night. Every year or so they dust it off and they kind of wax eloquently, if you will, as to what they think are, are, are their philosophies on management of these assets and uh, distribution and access and kind of their important things. And it changes over time, which is why you update it periodically. But when you die, the concept is it's a, a then current kind of snapshot of mom and dad's views of the world and the distribution. And that's the guidance letter, right? It provides guidance generationally as, as long as the trust is in existence. So, all right, obviously a lot of stuff. Scratch the surface. Keep it simple. It's not overly complicated. You got to engage in the process. Um, one thing I will point out here, and I want to make very clear, um, you know, your, your current professionals are very important in this process. And, and our approach uh, over time has been we will work in any capacity, all right, uh, with any uh, of your current professionals. We'll work on, uh, alongside them, we'll consult with them, behind them, in front of them, whatever it is you want. We're not here to replace. We do this, we do this all the time, and um, we've developed some expertise in it. I'm not saying we're the only show in town, um, but it's something we're passionate about. I'm extremely passionate about it, having lived through it. Um, and I'm starting to get some gray hair, and, and usually that's a good thing when you're working with an attorney. That means they've got some life experience, and, and that's an important thing as well. So I thank you very, very much for your time. Um, I get tired of listening to myself, so I can't imagine uh, how you guys feel right now. But um, Thank you for being out here on a cold winter's night. Well, we'd like to thank uh, Randy Johnson, Dave Dvorak, and Dave Mayer for coming out tonight and sharing this information with us. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of you uh, for attending. So once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good night, guys.